A very good morning friends. I welcome you all to the Shankar Summary 2024. Today we are going to see second part of our economics compilation video. Here are the list of articles which we are going to discuss today. Let's get started. Let us look at this quiz question. This quiz question is talking about fully accessible route mechanism for investment. Before answering, let us see in a brief about fully accessible route to get concepts clear. Reserve Bank of India RBI has introduced a separate channel of investment called fully accessible route in 2020. See, it enables the non-resident Indians NRIs to invest in specified government bonds. An important point to be noted here is that the eligible investors can invest in specified government securities without being subjected to any kind of investment ceilings. See, this scheme will operate along with the two existing routes of FPI like uh, medium term framework and voluntary retention route. See, this is the basic of our uh, FAR. In our discussion, now let us see some facts about voluntary retention mechanism to have a clear picture of these things. See, VRR or voluntary retention route is another scheme introduced by RBI to encourage the foreign portfolio investors for long term investments in the Indian debt markets. See, it provides operational flexibility and exemptions from certain regulatory requirements. Moreover, this route requires a retention period of over 3 years with the FBI's maintaining a minimum of 75% of allotted amount in India. See, the investment levels are available on tap and allotted by Clearing Corporation of India Limited CCIL on a first come first serve basis. See, this is the base points about voluntary retention routes. So, with this basic idea, now let's go back and solve this question. See the first statement, eligible NRIs can invest in specified government securities without subjected to any kind of investment ceilings. See this is correct as we have seen in our discussion about FAR. See the second statement, it operates alongside with two existing routes of MTF and VRR. See this is also correct as we have seen in our discussion. So both the statements are correct. So the correct option is option C. Let us move on to solve the next MCQ. Look at this question. This question talks about a concept called safe harbor which was recently seen in the news. Before solving, let us see in a brief about what is safe harbor is. Firstly, safe harbor is a protection available under section 79 of the IT Act 2000. See, it is a legal immunity that online intermediaries like Insta, FB, X enjoy against the contents which are being posted on it by the users. Know that this protection is available as long as these platforms abide by the rules set and due diligence requirements such as censoring content when asked by the government or courts. See, this concept originally came from section 230 of the United States Communications Decency Act which has been termed as one of the foundational laws behind the modern internet. Okay, now we should know why this concept has flared up in the recent news. See, Digital India Act 2023, which was a positive to replace the IT Act 2000, reviews this safe harbor principle. See, as we have seen now, this is the principle which primarily shields the online platforms from the liability related to user generated content. With this removal, this can be counterproductive to the fundamental rights of expression. So with this basics, let us go back and solve the question. See, the term safe harbor which was seen in the news is associated with, uh, see out of four options, we know that the correct option is option A, online content. See with this basics, let us move on to the next MCQ. See, this MCQ is about the non-banking financial companies or NBFC. As we know that this is an important concept which can be asked again and again in the exam. So, in this context in our discussion today let us see some important points about nbfc and we shall see the concepts and then we shall come again and solve this question okay let's start our discussion non-banking financial companies or nbfcs are financial institutions that provides banking services but know that they do not hold a full banking license in india for example they are registered under companies act 1956 whereas a commercial bank will obtain license for commercial banking business under section 22 of the Banking Regulation Act 1949. Moving on our discussion, NBFCs are regulated by variety of organizations like NBFCs like investments and credit companies, core investment companies, infrastructure finance companies are regulated by RBI. On the other hand, NBFCs like housing finance companies are regulated by National Housing Bank. Moreover, merchant banker venture capital funds companies are regulated by SEBI. 
Fourthly, insurance companies are regulated by IRDAI and fifthly, chit fund companies are regulated by their respective state governments and finally, nidhi companies are regulated by Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India. See, this is why I mentioned that NBFCs are regulated by various types of organization depends upon the target group whom they work for. Okay, moving forward, let us see how NBFCs are different from banks. See, the, the first major difference is in relation to the demand deposits. See, while the banks can accept demand deposits, NBFCs cannot accept it. Here, demand deposits are nothing but savings account. The second difference is NBFCs do not form part of the payment and settlement system while we know that banks are of course a part of the system. Thirdly, NBFCs cannot issue checkbooks. Then, NBFCs cannot offer money transfer services like the traditional banks. The moving on, the next major difference is that NBFCs do not have to maintain any reserve ratio such as cash reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, while banks must mandatorily maintain these reserve ratios. Also, NBFCs cannot provide deposit insurance facilities which are offered by the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation. What does it mean? It means deposit insurance is a protection mechanism provided by the government to safeguard depositors' money which is held in the banks. It assures the depositors that their funds up to certain limit will be reimbursed even if the bank fails. In India, NBFCs cannot provide deposit insurance. So, if you deposit money in NBFC and if that NBFC become insolvent, then the money deposited with the NBFC will be completely lost. See, these are some of the differences between the bank and NBFCs. With this broad basics, now let us go back and solve the question. See the first statement. It says that NBFCs cannot engage in acquisition of the securities which are issued by the government. See, this statement is incorrect because NBFCs will be primarily engaged in the business of loans and advances, acquisitions of the shares, stock, bonds, debentures, etc. So the statement one is incorrect. See the second one. NBFCs cannot accept demand deposits like the savings account. See, of course this is correct because we have seen in our discussion. So the statement one alone is incorrect. So the correct option is option B. See the basic. Let us move on to the next MCQ. Let us look at this MCQ. It talks about Financial Action Task Force or FATF. Before solving this question, we ought to know why this has appeared in the news. See, FATF or Financial Action Task Force has recently removed the Cayman Island from the grey list. See, this may lead to positive FTA flow from this region in the near future to India. See, this is the context on which the question appeared. See this question. Now, we shall discuss the basics about FATF before uh, we are going to solve the question. So, firstly, what does Financial Action Task Force or FATF? See, FATF is an intergovernmental body established in 1989 during the G7 summit in Paris. The objective of the body is to set the standards and promote effective implementation of the legal, regulatory and operational, operational measures for combating money laundering, terror financing and other related issues that will threat the integrity of the international financial system. See, its secretariat is located at the OECD headquarters in Paris. Note that FATF also added terror financing as the main area of focus. See, this was done after the 9-11 terror attack of the US. Then, later, the focus was broadened to include restricting the funding of the weapons of mass destruction. Now, moving on our discussion. See, FATF includes 39 countries including US, India, China, Saudi Arabia, Britain, German, etc. Know an important point that India became a member of FATF in 2010. Note that the FATF plenary is the decision-making body of the FATF. It meets three times per year. Now, let us see the two types of list of FATF. Firstly, grey list. See, officially it is termed as jurisdiction under increased monitoring. See, the countries that are considered safe haven for supporting the terror financing and money laundering are put in the FATF grey list. See, this inclusion serves as a warning to the country that it may enter blacklist. Okay, secondly, blacklist. See, it is called high risk jurisdiction subject to, subject to call for action. See, these blacklist countries are often termless non-cooperative countries or territories or NCCT. Know that these countries support 
terror funding and money laundering activities. FATF revives the blacklist regularly, adding or deleting the entities. Know that currently North Korea, Iran, Myanmar are in the blacklist. Okay, now let us see what are the consequences of being put in the blacklist. See, firstly, no financial aid will be given to them by the IMF, World Bank, ADB or EU. Secondly, they also face a number of international economic and financial restrictions and sanctions. See, this is the basic about the FATF. Now, let us solve the question. See the first one. India is a member of the tax force. See, this is correct. As we have seen that India became a member in 2010. So, the statement one is correct. See the second one. The mandate of the group is to deal with the money laundering only. See, this is wrong because we saw that the mandate of the group varies from money laundering to terror financing to weapons of mass destruction, etc. So, the statement is wrong. Third one is non cooperative territories are placed under the grey list of FATF. See, this is wrong because the technical name of blacklist is called non cooperative territories. So, the third statement is also wrong. So, the correct option is option A. With this basics, now let us move on to the next MCQ. Look at this MCQ. It talks about an economic concept called evergreening. Okay. Before solving the MCQ, we shall see about the concept of evergreening. See, the term evergreening of loan refers to a banking practice in which the bank attempts to sustain a loan which is on the brink of uh, default by providing further loans to the same default borrower. See, it's a temporary fix that generally obscures the true condition of stressed loans and delays the recognition of the losses by the banks. See, the objective is to prevent the loans from being classified as non-performing assets and to minimize the impact on the profitability of the banks and provisioning requirements. Simple. See, it refers to a specific types of loan where the principal payment is deferred and typically only the interest is expected to pay until the end of loan term. See, this setup allows for the indefinite postponement of the principal and operates similar to the revolving credit. Okay, now let us see the reasons for adopting this practice. Firstly, impact on the profitability. See, banks need to make higher provisions if an account turns to an NPA as we know that NPA will significantly impact their profitability. Secondly, avoiding NPA classification. See, banks resort to evergreening to avoid classifying them as the NPA thereby delaying the recognition of losses. Thirdly, liquidity and provisioning. See, evergreening allows the banks to avoid provisioning to cover loan losses and help them to maintain liquidity. Okay, with this, let us see what are the methods of evergreening. Firstly, interbank arrangements. See, banks collaborate to evergreen each other's loan through sale and buyback of the loans or debt instruments. Secondly, structured deals. See, it will encourage sound borrowers to engage in the structured deal with the stressed borrowers to conceal the stress. Thirdly, internal adjustments. It involves the use of internal or office account to adjust the borrower's repayments obligation. Fourthly, renewal of loans. See, renewing the loan or dispersing the new or additional loans to the stressed borrowers or related entities which are closer to the repayment date of the earlier loans. So, with this basics about evergreening, now let us solve the question. The term evergreening makes news repeatedly in the recent past. Which of the following better defines it? See, out of the four options, option B, a banking practice to deal with a bad loan fits the correct definition of evergreening. So, the correct option is option B. So, with this basics, let us move on to the next MCQ of the day. Look at this MCQ. It lists four types of funds and it asks us how many of them will fit into the definition of alternate investment fund. Before answering this, we ought to be aware about the basics of alternate investment fund AIF. Let us start our discussion. See, AIF or alternative investment funds are the special investment category funds which are very different from the conventional investment instruments. Know that any AIF has two characteristics. They are the funds which are established in India and secondly, they are the privately pooled instrument vehicle which collects funds from the sophisticated investors who are both from foreign or Indian for investing. See, it pools funds from the investors and invests them under different category of investments as specified by SEBI for the benefit of borrowers. Know that this investment vehicle must adhere to the regulations of the SEBI under SEBI Alternative Investment Fund Regulations 20. Well, we should know that the various forms of AIF are venture capitalists, infra funds, limited liability partnership, trust, etc. Now, moving on our discussion, we shall see about three categories of the AIFs. Category 1. See, this kind of investments can invest in startups, early stage ventures, social ventures, SMEs and sectors in which the government or regulators consider as 
socially or economically desirable. C. It includes the venture capital funds like angel funds, SME funds, social venture funds, etc. Secondly, category 2 alternative investment funds. Here, these are the funds which are not classified either under category 1 or under category 3. See, they do not undertake leverages or borrowing other than to meet the day-to-day -day operational requirements and as permitted in the regulations. Thirdly, we should know that the various types of funds are the real estate fund, debt fund, private equity fund, funds for the distressed assets, etc. And finally, category 3 AFs. See, these are the funds which employ complex or diversive traditional diverse trading strategies and may employ leverages including the investments in the listed or unlisted hedge funds, pipe funds, etc. We should know the basics that category 1 and 2 are closed under funds and having a minimum tenure of 3 years, whereas the category 3 can be either open-ended or closed-ended funds. Here we should know the basic about them, right? Open-ended funds can be brought or sold anytime, whereas the closed-ended funds can be brought only during the launch and can be redeemed only when the investment tenure is over. See, with this broad basics, let us go back and solve the MCQ related to AAF. See, out of this four funds which are listed, all four of them will fit into the definition of alternative investment funds. So, the correct option is option D. With this basics, now let us move on to the next MCQ of the day. Look at this MCQ. This MCQ is about the statements regarding credit information companies. See, the news about credit information companies often appeared in the newspaper. So, it is very important from our exam perspective. See, here two statements are given. First, we are gonna see about the basics of CIC before answering this. Let's start our discussion. Firstly, credit rating agencies or CRA is a company that assigns credit ratings which rate debt as ability to pay back the debt by making the timely principal and interest. See, they collect public data, credit transaction, payment history of the individuals and companies regarding the loan, credit card, etc. Note that the primary function is to gather the data from the various sources like bank, lenders, financial institutions and other rating agencies, etc. See, then the CICs will compile this data and make a credit report. Okay, now with this basics, let us see the benefits of CAC. Firstly, banks, NBFCs refers to the CAC reports and scores to decide the credit worthiness of the borrowers before granting a loan or issuing a credit card. Secondly, an important point to be noted is that CACs in India are licensed by RBI and governed by Credit Information Companies Regulation Act 2005 or SICRA and they will be often regulated by the various rules and regulations issued by the RBI. See, as per section 15 of the SICRA Act, every credit institutions like banks should be a member of at least one CIC. Moreover, SICRA Act stipulates that a CIC may seek and obtain information from its members only. Okay, now, at present, four CICs are given certificate of registration by the RBA. They are Credit Information Bureau India Limited, Sybil, Equifax Credit Information Services Private Limited, Experian, Credit Information Company of India Private Limited and CRI of High Market Credit Information Services Private Limited. So with this basics, let us now see the question. First thing, they collect the credit history of both the individuals and companies to create credit report. See this statement is correct because as we have seen in our discussion. Secondly, know that CACs are regulated by the Reserve Bank of India. See this is also correct. And guys, I am giving an extra data that credit rating agencies which is very different from CAC, credit rating agencies are regulated by SEBI. Okay. So here, both the statements are correct. So with this basics, let us move on to the next MCQ of the day. Look at this question. It is about the concept called base erosion and profit sharing. It states that which of the following better describes the BEPS. Okay. Now, before answering this question, let us look at a concept which is very much related to BEPS, which is called Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement or DTAA. Okay, let's start our discussion. See, DTAA is a treaty signed between two or more countries. The key objective of DTAA is that the taxpayers in these countries can avoid being taxed twice for the same income which is generated by them. Know that it is applicable in the cases where a taxpayer residing in one country A and earn his income from other country B. Now moving on in our discussion, know that India establishes DTAA with other countries through section 90 of the IT Act 1961. Presently, India has DTAA with more than 80 countries. See, it is legislated on a reciprocal basis 
and covers residents of India as well as residents of the negotiating country. Here you should know about an important point that an individual or a corporation, not a resident of India or the country which is or the country with which India signed DTA cannot claim benefits under the DTA. Moving on our discussion, DTA can either cover all types of income or it can also target a specific type of income depending upon the types of businesses or holdings etc. Okay, now the following categories are generally covered under a double taxation avoidance agreement. They are services, salary, property, capital gains, savings or fixed deposit accounts. So with this basics, now let us see the question. Here BEPS is very much related to the tax avoidance strategy that is option B. So with this uh, basic points, let us move on to the next MCQ. Look at this MCQ. This MCQ is about the statements with reference to minimum support price or MSP. See, questions about MSP will often ask in the UPSC preliminary examinations. So, it is in our best interest to know inside out about MSP. Okay, now let us start our discussion. See, in the slides, I have attached it to recent previous question based on MSP for your understanding. Please have a look at them. Now, let us see about MSP from exam perspective. Firstly, what is minimum support price or MSP? See, MSP is a form of market intervention by the government of India. It is the price at which the government purchases the crop from the farmers. Know that by doing so, it will protect the farmers against any sharp fall in the prices. Moreover, MSP is announced by the central government at the beginning of every sowing season. To be more precise, MSP is approved by Cabinet Committee of Economic Affairs chaired by the Prime Minister on the basis of the recommendation by Commission for the Agricultural Cost and Price or CACP. Now, I am displaying the determinants of MSP for your reference. Please have a look at them. Now, let us see the objectives of MSP. See, in simple words, it is the price fixed by the Government of India to protect the farmers against excessive fall in prices during the bumper production years. On the other hand, during any drought season, it will provide a guarantee price for the produce. Thirdly, it will ensure food security in the country as the crops procured under MSP is used for PDS system. See, this is all about the objectives. Now, let us see the crops which are covered under MSP. See, government announces MSP for 22 mandated crops and FRP for sugarcane. See, among the 22 crops, 14 belong to Karif season, 6 belong to Rabi season and 2 belong to commercial crops. Here, I am displaying the list of uh, crops for your reference. So, please uh, memorize them often as it is directly asked in the preliminary. So, with this basic points, let us move on to solving the question. Here, the first statement states that MSP is fixed with the government on the basis of the recommendations of the CACP. So, we know that it is correct. See the second statement. The Rangarajan committee recommended that the MSP should be at least 50% more than the weighed average. See, this statement is wrong because this... Uh, Recommendation is given by Swaminathan Commission, not Rangarajan Commission. See the third statement. In India, MSP is applicable to 22 Karif, Rabi and commercial crops including sugarcane. See this is wrong because we know that sugarcane is given a separate price called FRP which is very different from MSP. So eliminating 2 and 3, the correct option is option A. So this basics, let us move on to the next MCQ. Look at this MCQ, it talks about the lending instruments of the IMF. Like other questions, before answering, let us get into the basics of the various lending instruments of the International Monetary Fund. See, the first one is Standby Agreement. See, the Standby Agreement provides short-term financial assistance to the countries who are facing the balance of payment problems. Historically, it has been the IMF lending instrument most used by the advanced and emerging market countries. See, when a country receives funds via SBA, then that country must take measures to address the problems that led the country to seek funding in the first place. Moreover, SBA is provided in tranches and before each tranche is provided, the IMF reviews the country's policies. Recently, IMF provided bailout packages for the Pakistan is also provided under SBA facility. Okay, now the second one is Standby Credit Facility or SCF. See, the SCF provides financial assistance to the low-income countries with short-term balance of payment needs. Know that it's one of the facilities provided under Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust PRGT of IMF. Note that both SBA and SCF are provided to avoid present prospective 
or potential balance of payment crisis. See, when the BOP crisis or balance of payment crisis extends for a protracted period, then the IMF provides support through extended fund facility or extended credit facility. See, both these facilities provide financial assistance to the countries which are facing serious medium term BOP problems because of the structural weaknesses that requires time to address. To help countries implement the medium term frameworks, these facilities offer longer program engagement, longer repayment period. See the advanced and emerging economies are offered extended fund facility and the low income countries are provided extended credit facility. Know that in 2019, Pakistan used the extended fund facility to get financial support from the IMF. On moving on our discussion. For urgent BOP needs, the IMF has rapid financing instrument facility and rapid credit facility. Here note that this RCF or rapid credit facility appeared in 2022 preliminary question. Okay, now back to our discussion. See, both are designed to provide funding to the countries that are experiencing a sudden and unexpected BOP crisis. Here, the RFI is mainly used by the advanced and the emerging economies and RCF is mostly used by the low income countries. The next one is short term liquidity line or SLL. Here, the SLL is provided for IMF countries with a very strong policy frameworks and fundamentals who face potential moderate short term liquidity needs. See, these countries with strong policy frameworks fall into the BOP shocks due to external shocks. The SLL aims to minimize the risk of these shocks thereby avoiding the crisis to go into a deeper crisis and eventually spread into other countries. See the next one is flexible credit line. See the FCL is provided to the countries with very strong policy frameworks and track records in economic performance. Know that the financial support received under FCL is used to prevent the crisis from happening. Then comes the precautionary and liquidity line PLL. See, it's designed to meet the liquidity needs of the member countries with sound economic fundamentals but with some remaining vulnerabilities that preclude them from using the FCL facilities. To put it simply, basically countries with good economic fundamentals but not good enough to receiving funding via FCL will receive PLL facility. Finally, there is resilience and sustainability facility or RSF. See, it provides affordable long-term financing to the countries which are undertaking reforms to reduce the risks to prospective balance of payment stability including those related to climate change, pandemic preparedness, etc. Okay. See, these are all the various lending instruments of the IMF. So, to back to our discussion, see here out of these three statements, see the first one and second one. These two are correct because just now we have seen it in our discussion. Now, regarding the third statement, see, India has received packages from IMF via both SBA and EAF and EFF. See, in 1981, India received EFF fund and between 1957 to 91, India received SBA fund. Here, the correct option is option C. With this basic understanding, let us move on to the next MCQ of the day. Look at this MCQ. It talks about the institution called National Company Law Tribunal. See, it often appeared in the news. So, the various composition and functioning of the NCLT is very important for the examination perspective. Before answering, let us go and brush up our fundamentals regarding NCLT. See, firstly, NCLT, National Company Law Tribunal, was constituted in 2016 under the Companies Act 2013. See, it's a statutory body which means created by the parliamentary law. Know that it was formed to deal with the corporate disputes that are of civil in nature. This means NCLT works on the line of normal civil court in the country. But the difference is they are constituted specifically to deal with the civil corporate disputes which are arising out of Companies Act 2013. Note that NCLT decides the matters in accordance with the principles of natural justice. Since it's performing judicial functions, it's also called a quasi-judicial authority. Now, let us see the benches of NCLT. See, it has a principal bench at New Delhi. Apart from this, it also has benches at Ahmedabad, Allahabad, Bengaluru, Chandigarh, Chennai, Gauhati, Hyderabad, Kolkata and Mumbai. See with this basics. Now let us see the composition of the body. See, it consists of a president and some other judicial and technical members. The president of the tribunal will be appointed by the central government after consultation with Chief Justice of India. Note that the president of the NCLT must be a judge of high court or he has been a judge of the high court for five years. Now coming to the members, 
the members of the tribunal are appointed by the central government based on the recommendation of the selection committee see this is all about the composition now finally let us see the functions of nclt firstly nclt adjudicates the cases related to insolvency and liquidation of the corporate companies see this role to nclt is mandated under insolvency and, and bankruptcy code 2016 here note that the nclt deals with the insolvency of only corporates under the code but in the case of the insolvency of the individuals and partnerships it will be dealt by debt recovery tribunal secondly nclt deals with the cases pending under sick industries company special provisions act 1985 see it was enacted to detect the unviable companies or sick companies that has potential systematic financial risk so if any cases are filed under such a act it will be subsequently dealt by nclt finally nclt plays a crucial role in facilitating the mergers and acquisitions when two or more companies wish to merge they must seek the approval of the nclt see the tribunal examines the proposal and ensures that it is compliant with the relevant law and regulations if the merger is approved the nclt oversees the process of integration and ensures that the interest of all stakeholders are being protected note that if anyone is aggrieved by the decisions of the nclt then they can make an appeal before ncl at that is national company law appellate tribunal and all the decisions of the national company law appellate tribunal can be challenged to supreme court see this is all regarding the discussion so with this basics now let us go back and solve the mcq here let us see the first statement it says that nclt deals with the corporate disputes that are of both civil and criminal in nature see this statement is incorrect because we have known from our discussion that nclt deals with the corporate civil disputes secondly the decisions of the nclt can be directly appealed before the supreme court see this is incorrect because for such appeals ncalt has been created the third one is it deals with the insolvency cases of the corporate bodies under ibc see this statement is correct actually because as we have seen in our discussion now so the correct option is option a so with this basics let us move on to discuss next mcq look at this mcq what is the purpose of setting up of small finance bank in india see we know that small finance banks payment banks and the nuances between them are often asked in the preliminary so before answering let us go on have a basic about them now let's start our discussion firstly let us see about payment banks see there are two kinds of banking license that are granted by the reserve bank of india that is universal banking license and differentiated banking license payment bank comes under differentiated banking license since it cannot offer all the services that a commercial bank offers note that a payment bank cannot lend it can take deposits up to 1 lakh per account it can issue debit cards but not credit cards okay now what's the main aim of payment banks see the major objective of the payment bank is to further the financial inclusion by providing small saving accounts and payment or remittance services to the migrant laborers low income households small businesses and other unorganized sectors the other functions are the payment bank can work as a bc or banking correspondent of another bank by doing so they can distribute the simple financial products like mutual funds insurance products etc okay now with this let us see about small finance bank see small finance banks are a category of banks that are established to provide basic banking services and credit facilities to the underserved sections of the population see it includes small business owners msmes farmers and unorganized sector the various examples of small finance banks are ujjivan capital small finance bank utkars etc now let us see what are the aims of small finance banks see the objective is to provide financial inclusion to the segments which are often excluded from the traditional banking system see it helps them to have access to financial products like small loans savings insurance etc now let us see the regulation of small finance banks note that they are regulated by rbi all norms and regulations of the rbi that are applicable to the commercial banks including the requirement of crr slr maintenance are generally applicable to the small finance banks also according to the rbi if any small finance bank want to become a universal bank it has to complete satisfactory track record of performance for a minimum period of 5 years see this is regarding the discussion with this basic now let us go on solve the mcq see here it asked about the purpose of setting up of small finance bank see the first statement 
to supply credit to the small business units. See this correct since we have seen in our discussion. Secondly, credit to small and marginal farmers also correct because just now we have seen. See the third one. It encouraged the young entrepreneurs to set up business particularly in the rural areas. See, this may look correct but it's not the main aim of setting up of this SFB. So the correct option is option A. See, this is all regarding the discussion. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IS Academy. Thank you.